The following is an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming. Hello, welcome to our new series, Art Glass Today. My name is Brian McMillan. I am a glass artist from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I have been working in the medium for over 35 years. And uh, over those years, I've started off as a stained glass artist, moved on to working in mosaics, uh, sandblasting. And lately, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with warm glass, which is basically glass that is put into the kiln. Now over this series, you are going to get to learn a lot about all those different techniques that we use and learn a bit more about how art glass is used in our homes and in our world today. But to understand the present, we need to go back to the past and understand the voyage that uh, has got us to this point in working with uh, art glass. I think most people still, when they think about glass, will think about stained glass, whether it's a church that they grew up in that had some beautiful stained glass windows, uh, whether it was when they were traveling and they had an opportunity to go into a cathedral and just be totally knocked out by the wonderful, awe-inspiring, large stained glass windows that they would see in those settings. So if we keep in mind, what was the objective at that time? What were they trying to do? What, uh, what, how did they want to use the art glass in that case? Uh, in most cases, it was to tell a story. They wanted to be able to bring a story to people that basically either A, didn't have books, or B, could not read those books even if they had them. After that, as the churches got bigger windows, it became important to actually be able to control the light, which is still the same reason that we use art glass in our homes a lot today, to control the light. So they had these larger windows. They wanted to keep the people focusing on the priest or the minister at the front of the church at the altar. So then, of course, fast forward to the Victorian era, all of a sudden, stained glass became a lot more inexpensive it could be, because it could be mass produced. The tools improved. And um, also, because of that era, people were looking to decorate their home in different ways. Uh, at the same time, Louis Comfort Tiffany came along and he introduced a whole new type of glass, which is called opalescent glass. He and John Lafarge were both experimenting at that time, trying to come up with a new glass that would differentiate what they were doing from what was happening in Europe. If we fast forward to the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, stained glass was a very popular hobby. People were looking for something creative to do with their time. They wanted to have something they could show for it. They wanted to be able to you know, uh, make a stained glass window for their home to personalize it, perhaps a lamp, perhaps gifts to give away um, as gifts, etc. So those are the kind of settings where stained glass has traditionally been used. What I'd like to do now is take a minute and we will look at some of the different styles of glass and the different types of, of uh, art glass that are available for us to use in our homes today. First of all, I would like to talk about what is called cathedral glass. Now cathedral glass basically means that you can see through it. It can be clear such as this piece or it can be colored such as this piece here and it will can have a texture to it. So the clear glass here in my one hand is called raindrop and the way these textures are imparted to the glass there are two rollers and when the glass is in a molten form it goes through the roller like this and the bottom roller will have the texture to it. So the top is smooth so we can cut it the bottom has a texture to it the texture can be raindrop, which I think we can see here, the different raindrops. It can be what's called a ripple texture. And a ripple texture, you can see the way it catches the light. This is fantastic for borders on projects, etc., or somewhere where we want to have a nice sparkle. These glasses are frequently used uh, today by people in their kitchen cabinets. This one is called crinkle and looks really fantastic in a uh, kitchen cabinet. It really catches the light. And you don't need the light to go through this glass to be effective. It's really nice just bouncing off of all these, um, these crinkles that we have on the, on the texture of this glass. We also have this glass here, which is called Flemish. And again, can be very attractive uh, in a border of a window or for a kitchen cabinet. And there are some other ones that are really meant to be more standalone. This one is called a, uh, 
uh, more of a Celtic design, they call it actually. And so this is an example of how you can get a colored piece of glass with a texture on it. But keep in mind that as we're using glass for, uh, we're going to be cutting glass for different purposes, there's always one smooth side to the glass. I was mentioning opalescent glass, and this is an example of opalescent glass. And so you can see the difference with this glass is you can't see through it. So uh, Tiffany wanted the eye to stop at the glass and for people to be looking at his artwork and not looking through the window. So this is great for that. And also, if you can imagine, if you're doing a stained glass lamp, you don't want to see the bulb and all the workings of uh, the hardware inside the lamp. So opalescent glass is fantastic for that. There are glasses that are in between those two. So this one, as you can see, you can see through quite readily, but it's not totally clear. It has an interesting streak to it. So this is called a streaky opalescent or a streaky cathedral, depending on how you want to want to look at it. And lastly, I'd just like to show you one specialty glass. And this is also a glass that uh, Tiffany uh, kind of invented, I guess you could say. This is called fracture streamer glass. So not only do we have the clear glass with a bit of a texture to it, but we have these wonderful fractures and the fractures are the uh, little blue pieces here, the green pieces that you can see. Uh, the way those are created is they blow a bubble when the glass is molten the size of a human being. They smash it so that the glass is super, super thin. Take all these little shards and put them on a, on a small metal table. Uh, the black lines are called streamers and those ones are created by taking a quarter inch piece of glass, heating it up with a torch and stretching it, then taking those pieces, putting on this metal table and then taking the, glass, the clear glass, going through the two rollers, and then dropping it down on top of these, and it becomes embedded in the back of the glass. So this glass is fantastic. It was often used by Tiffany to uh, give the feeling of a field of flowers, for example, or if there was a fall scene, he has um, some versions of this that have got oranges and browns, etc., and it's perfect for that. So that is the material that we're going to be using um, when we're working in our glass, whether it's stained glass, fused glass, whatever, we have all these different types of glass to work with. So what I'd like to do now, I'm going to clear off my work table here and I'm going to get some tools and I'll show you how to cut glass. Tiffany invented the idea of plating glass, but a lot of other artists took that idea and ran with it. One of those studios that was really exceptional at that was Lamb Studios, and this is a window that they built in the late 1800s. I had the fortunate experience of going down to San Francisco and taking a restoration workshop at the Cypress Lawn Funeral Chapel where there are a lot of Lamb windows as well as original Tiffany's. But this is a wonderful example of plating, so I'd like to use this as our example as we go through the different process of a plating glass on the back of this uh, particular piece. I'd like you to look at the top here. You can see there's a single piece of blue glass above her head, and behind that is where all the detail with these different pieces are. Also, if we look at the large piece of uh, clothing in front of her legs, there's a single piece of glass there again with a lot of detail behind it. So how was this created? Well, in this case, we've got the window out of its frame. It was in an old stone frame. Um, we're hauling it down to our work table. Before we proceed to the next one though, you can see at the top there, this, is, this window is backwards. We put it backwards because the front was flat and the back had all the different plating, which was at many different heights. But you can see the sky here where it uh, has all these different pieces. So here on the table, you can see very clearly one big piece at the top, a limited number of pieces beside the body creating the rest of the sky. And again, that one piece for the, for the dress. Here you can see a little bit of, of the plating that's on the back. We've disassembled part of it. The, the purpose here was to clean it. After a hundred and some years, it was very dirty. There was a lot of condensation and dirt in it. So here I'm using a, a piece of a wood to actually bend the lead back so that I can remove the face in this particular piece, which actually has three different pieces of glass, one on top of another, giving you this beautiful rendition of, of the face of this angel. This is a good slide to see exactly what's going on with the plating. The plating didn't happen uniformly over the whole window. It's not like there's two windows and they were sandwiched one beside the other. In many cases, all there was was sections of the window that had all these um, extra pieces of glass. This is a wonderful picture of the face. You can see some of the splotching that is on the bottom of, of the neck, etc. That is what we're, we're cleaning up. 
Um, over the years, there is condensation. That's one of the problems with the plating process. It's very common for them to get fairly dirty because, of course, condensation and dirt gets in between the, the panels um, over the course of their life history. But just a beautiful painting that, done by a, an artist of very high quality. Most of these, because they are in a funeral setting or a mausoleum, are either angels or they they're, they're, have a religious context to them, so the eyes are looking up to heaven. So here we have the window all cleaned up and gloriously put back into its frame. And I think you can see how much more sparkle there is to this now that it's been cleaned. So I hope that gives you a good idea of exactly how these types of plated windows are constructed. So what is this material called glass that we're gonna be trying to cut into different shapes? It's important that we think of glass in a different way than we do a lot of other things that we cut. I mean, we cut paper, we cut a loaf of bread into slices, we cut wood. But glass is really a totally different material. Now, a scientist will tell you that glass is actually a supercooled liquid. And I like to visualize it as having a skin on the top, a skin on the bottom, and this supercooled liquid in the center. And what we want to do is we're not trying to cut through deeply into the glass. We want to put a point of weakness on that top skin so that when we apply pressure and bend the glass, it will break along the mark that we put on the top, which we call a score. Uh, over the centuries, glass has been cut in many different ways. In medieval times, what they had was two hot pokers and a piece of glass. They would put one hot poker on the top, the second one on the bottom, and they would actually heat fracture the glass. Of course, this was not a very accurate way to cut the glass. Um, if you look at a medieval window, especially the earlier ones, they were generally large pieces of glass and um, they, were not, they didn't have to be cut all that accurately. Over time, they developed different pliers they could use to shape the glass and to become a little more accurate. But that is the way glass was cut for hundreds of years. In the Victorian era, things took a huge step in a positive direction as far as our ability to cut glass. The first thing that happened is Fletcher Terry came up with a glass cutter which has a wheel on the bottom of it. So this wheel would actually roll along the glass and make this mark that we want to make which is called a score. Before that, one step after the, uh, the hot pokers, they did use industrial diamonds. And um, there's still people that come in asking about industrial diamonds. I guess they must have read about them in old books. Uh, but industrial diamonds never really worked all that well. They were not that accurate and they did not get you a good score on the glass. This wheel is really what made things uh, much easier for uh, glaziers to cut glass into different shapes. And of course, if you think about the Victorian era, um, all the wonderful things that were happening, all the different curly cues that were being used in, in designs, a lot of circles, a lot of different odd shapes, paisley designs, etc. cetera, uh, this cutter is what made it all possible. So for many uh, decades, this glass cutter was the most popular glass cutter on the market. It's still used. Um, there are three different slots on this cutter. At one time, they used to have what was called single diamond, double diamond, and plate glass. And these were used to nibble little amounts off the glass. These days, our glass has gone metric and they never, no longer really perform any function. But this is a viable cutter if you're only cutting one or two pieces of glass, you don't plan on, on, on making a profession of cutting glass. Um, the way this cutter is to be held is between your first and second finger, your thumb goes at the back, and your first finger goes on the front. So it's kind of like having tea with the queen, your, your little finger is sticking out to the side. Now I'm gonna show you a number of different cutters before we get into the cutting process. Um, but this is the least expensive cutter you can buy and it will be good for one or two projects or if you're only cutting some clear glass at home to re replace a window panel. In the 60s, it became much more important to come up with a glass cutter that was easy to use. When people started to do um, glass as a hobby, they didn't want to spend weeks and weeks learning how to cut a, a piece of glass using a cutter that was not going to be very user friendly. So there was a number of changes that were made. First of all, this cutter has a much smaller wheel on it. Um, I think you can see that it's, it's quite tiny. So if you can imagine you're going through the mountains and you're gonna be turning on some corners, you're gonna be much happier if you have a small sports car with small wheels that can really track well than if you're in a large uh, you know, semi-trailer that is uh, gonna take a lot more uh, space to make those turns. So 
with this cutter head, you get a much better score when you're cutting uh, curves. Uh, it also has a hollow handle and the hollow handle is meant to put oil in. Uh, with the steel wheel cutters, what they used to do is stick their finger in a mixture of kerosene and oil, make a mark on the glass and then cut through it. So with this cutter, what they could do is they could put the oil in the handle and as they push down on the cutter, you can see there's a little bit of movement. That would allow the oil to come down and uh, lubricate the head while it was being used. So making a straight cutter with a carbide edge was the next step. Uh, then there are a lot of people that didn't have a lot of physical strength. And so they came up with a pistol grip cutter that you could hold like a pistol and you could get your whole arm, your whole body into it. And you didn't have to try and hold the cutter with your two fingers. So the pistol grip cutter is, uh, is a really good choice if you don't have a lot of physical strength. A cutter that's come out in the last decade or so, which I am very, uh, very fond of, is called a Thomas grip cutter. And I did avoid this cutter for many years because I thought it looked like it was just a gimmick. But I found that my fingertips were getting quite sore from holding the straight cutter. With this one, this fits into the, the web of my hand and my whole arm again can put the pressure on this cutter. I don't have to rely on my fingers to, uh, to hold onto the cutter tightly. That allows me to use a lot less effort when I'm making my score. And finally, uh, this is just a different version of the Thomas Grip Cutter. Uh, this is called a tap wheel cutter. And the advantage of this one is it's for people with bigger hands. And actually, I find that the Thomas Grip, the smaller one, is perfect for me. But this one uh, that does have an opportunity for you to actually flip everything around to make it more suitable for someone with a larger hand. So there's a little insert here which slips on. Then we can flip this around so that the, uh, the palm paddle is further down the handle. And then we put this back on. So now if you have a larger hand, uh, which as you can see, mine's not getting down to where I'd like it to be, um, this cutter is perfect for people with larger hands. So uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to uh, show you how to use these glass cutters, but I'm going to get a couple of pieces of colored glass, come back and we'll, we'll take a look at how to cut glass. Today I would like to tell you about a very unique stained glass artist. His name is Mark Chagall. He is a Russian who was born in 1887. He lived to be the, a very ripe age of 98, dying in France in 1985. He came to stained glass towards the end of his career, and probably his jewel in the crown of his stained glass work are the Jerusalem windows, which are installed in the Hadassah Memorial Hospital in Israel. I was quite surprised when I started doing some background in this. These windows are in a very small chapel. As a matter of fact, there's 12 windows, and there's three on each of four walls, and they take up the complete wall. So I would love to go there sometime. Apparently the, the floors are stone, the stained glass windows, the light that is reflected out of them is uh, reflected and absorbed by these wonderful stone floors as well as the walls that surround them. So what's unique about Chagall is that he came from a, an, a background of being a painter. And so he didn't really want to follow all the rules. In stained glass, as you can see from this slide here, there's a lot of black lines that are normally separating all of the designs in the stained glass window. When you look carefully at this though, you can see that that's not happening with Chagall. There are all these different buildings in that blue section in the center. All the images are actually contained within a single piece of glass. Now, how did he do this? You know, it was something that hadn't been done all that frequently up until this point. Well, he had a partner whose name was Mark and he was from France. He had worked a lot with glass. And the manufacturer of glass in France, Saint Just, made a lot of glass specifically for this project. So if you look at the wonderful blues, greens, reds, golds that are created here, those are glasses that are called flashed glass. They have a thin layer of color on top of a clear or a lighter base. In many cases, in this particular window, for example, it's a bit of a yellow base. So what they could do is they could use an acid to eat away a lot of the color. So for example, in this one in the center, you can see where it's totally clear. There are little bits of blue that are still showing through, and that is the color from the flashed glass. Also to the left of that, there's the two doves, and those again are 
in a red glass, a red flash glass, and they eat away different areas to uh, show the lighter color underneath. So what uh, Chagall also did is he used a black paint, and it's a, it's a vitreous paint that is actually fired into the glass. So all of the dark black lines that you see, the details, are painted on by hand. And vitreous paints are a mixture of powdered glass and um, actually lead. The lead helps it, to, helps it to flow nicely into the glass when it's actually fired. So they used a mixture of glass, uh, glass paint, glass enamels, um, sometimes to add just a little extra something, they would put some enamels into there. And also these pieces are very large, like these windows are 11 feet tall and 8 feet wide. So some of these individual pieces are also quite large. So that is something, again, that was a little, it's unique in the stained glass industry. Normally you want to have smaller pieces, again, because you're using all that detail that you're creating by those different pieces. If you get a chance to go to Israel, go to the Hadassah Hospital and see these in person, I think it would be a trip well worth taking. Okay, now comes the fun part. We're going to get a piece of glass and we're going to get a glass cutter and some uh, some breaking tools and we are going to start making our shapes in glass. Before I start talking about that though, let's talk a little bit about safety. The most important thing when you're cutting glass is to make sure that you either have prescription eyeglasses which are going to give you adequate protection or that you wear safety glasses. Uh, it's probably the, the worst thing is you can get a glass chip in your, in your eye. That's something you would definitely want to avoid. And as we're going through using the tools, I'll talk about how you can avoid making that happen. Uh, personally, everybody I know does not wear gloves when they work with glass. It's certainly an option if you feel that uh, that's something you want to pursue. I certainly wouldn't uh, you know, discourage you from doing that. But if you're careful and if you use the tools that I'm going to show you, I think you'll find that uh, gloves, personally, I find to be more of a hindrance than a safety measure. But definitely you should be wearing safety glasses. I'm wearing prescription glasses. Okay, so we are going to use, uh, I'm going to use the Thomas Grip Cutter because that's the one I feel comfortable with. And the reason I like this is because when it fits into the web of my hand, I can use my whole arm to make my score. Now I want to talk a little bit about body language. First of all, you have to have your body parallel to the edge of the table. And of course, then we have to talk about what kind of a table you're going to be using. This table is actually a little too low for me. I would highly recommend that if you're going to be doing much uh, glass cutting, you have a table built out of three quarter inch plywood and it should be approximately uh, hip height. You don't want to be bending over constantly. It's very hard on your back. So I would suggest a really good hard surface. I do not like cutting on carpet or drywall or anything that actually is going to uh, cause the glass to bend. You want the glass to remain completely straight. Uh, what I'm using here is a, uh, a waffle grid. And this is uh, made specifically for the glass industry. And I think you'll find that the glass cutter, the waffle grid, and the pliers are available at your local stained glass shop. Um, the waffle grid is really nice because all the glass chips will fall down into the little uh, cells that we have in here. And so when you put your hand down on your table, you're not going to be getting a glass chip embedded in your hand. And actually, that's what happens more frequently than anything else as far as cutting goes. So. Uh, we have our body parallel to the edge of the table and I would suggest cutting up at roughly a 45 degree angle. So adjusting our glass so that that's possible. Uh, basically the Goldilocks principle comes into play here. Too hard a score is not a benefit. Too light a score is not a benefit. You want to be just right in between. The, right, the best way to get a good score is to have a good sharp glass cutter. If you've had one that's been sitting around for years and years, you'll probably find that even if you haven't used it, uh, the wheel is oxidized and it's not going to be that effective. So you want to make sure that you have a good cutter. Uh, these days, the ones with the carbide wheels are definitely the way to go. Body parallel to the edge of the table. If you can imagine that this, this work surface is your glass, if you put your glass cutter right on the edge and you push down, it'll just keep rolling off on you all the time. What you want to do is put it on the edge and then slightly forward and then start making your score. So I've got my glass here and now this is just basically regular three millimeter glass. Uh, all art glass is basically three millimeters. Uh, there's no value for us having thicker glass. So um, I'm putting my glass cutter on the edge. I'm going slightly forward, a minimum eighth of an inch, sometimes a quarter of an inch, and I'm going to make a score from one side to the other. That scratching sound is called the score. 
that was what I would consider a good pressure, uh, a good amount of pressure for this score. Now I'd like to push too hard just so you can hear the difference. And if I hold this up, I think you can see that this score is dramatically darker than my first score, which is what I would consider a proper score. Overscoring, it'll break okay on a straight line like this, but when you start doing curves, it's not going to break anywhere near as well as a good medium pressure score. So once we've made the score, how do we break it? Uh, there are a few different ways. Uh, the simplest thing is to use your hands. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be going up with my fingers and down with my thumb. So I'm twisting it like this. So I put one thumb on one side of the score, the other thumb on the other side, and I am applying pressure. So I'd like you to see, basically, I was bending it uh, that amount of degrees to break it with my hands. Now the other option is to take a pair of running pliers. And you can see with these running pliers, there are curved jaws top and bottom. And what they do is they're going to mimic what my hand was doing. They're going to push down from the corners and up from the bottom. Notice there's a screw on the top of this tool. So that is your clue that this tool is being held properly. If I flip it over, it's going to do the total opposite of what I want it to do. You can see that it's smiling at me. It's telling me that I'm making a mistake. So have your screw facing up. Now, in reality, that's also a good thing to keep in mind with your glass cutter. The glass cutter also has a screw on it and we want to keep that screw facing up. So the uh, running plier has a line on the center which is in line with our screw. In this case I'm going to just line it up with my score line and squeeze and I'd like to show you the small amount of bend that was required to break that. So with the running pliers, your success rate is going to be much higher because you don't have to bend the glass as much and therefore you have more control of it. Now these pliers are wonderful. I can now take this piece and cut it in half and again I just line it up with the score and squeeze. Breaks it very nicely. And same thing if I'm doing a curve. I can take this and I can make a curved line. And I can take this and the only difference with the curve. Now you can see what, why we call this running the score. Um, when I started putting pressure on this end, it's actually the score has been separated all the way to this point. Now if I continued to put pressure on here, um, it would probably break off to the edge rather than going to the end. So what I do is I flip this around and I'm going to use my pliers from this other end and I can get a really nice break on both sides. And when you look at it, isn't that amazing how close this is? I mean, there's very little excess glass there. If I tried to break this with my hands, it would not have broken properly. So I highly recommend uh, running pliers for separating your glass pieces. Uh, there's another tool that I would like to introduce you to, which are our grosier pliers. Now these pliers have a flat jaw on the top and a curved jaw on the bottom. And so when we apply pressure on the glass to break, uh, to separate the pieces of glass, the flat side will be pushing cleanly down on the glass and the bottom is not going to rub against it. So this can, get, uh, can be very helpful when we're trying to break off small pieces. Now the running pliers will only work if the piece of glass is fairly close to the width of the pliers. If it's narrower, there's just not enough of a bend for it to work properly. So these grosier pliers are really excellent. Uh, I line them up on one side of the score and then I can put my hand on the other side and break off that little piece. So you can see I can break some very small pieces um, with the grosier pliers. So uh, that is our basic cutting lesson. So thank you very much for watching.
The proceeding was an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming.